Okay. So last semester, uh, we discussed about uh, different shapes, different structures, different arrangements of microorganisms. We discussed about the fact we have spherical shapes, uh, spiral shape, uh, rod shape, uh, coma shape, amorphic or polymorphic bacteria. Today we are talking about uh, this specific uh, this specific topic that includes one genus. So you already know that if uh, the name of bacteria includes coccus or cochi or cocci, that means it is spherical shape. Uh, if we say strepto coccus, they're arranged in chains. If we say monococcus, a single. If you say diplo coccus, arranged in pairs. Staphylococcus, arranged in clusters like grapes. Tetracoccus, they divide on two axes, so they are arranged in four. Sarsina in three dimensions, they are arranged in cubic shape. So the name will suggest you the shape of bacteria, the arrangement, um, and morphology, yes, right. Uh, I don't know if you, all of you know, but there is one more tip how, how you can keep in mind difference between all gram-negative and all gram-positive bacteria. So, uh, you take the genus name, not kingdom, phylum, class order, not species, genus name, and you look in the end of the word. You look in the end of the word. If the word finishes with A, in 99% cases, it is gram-negative bacteria. If we finish the word with any other letter, it is gram-positive bacteria. So, now you can check it out. Staphylococcus, is gram-positive. Streptococcus, gram-positive. Mycobacterium is gram-positive. Neisseria, gram-negative. Escherichia, gram-negative. Shigella, Salmonella, Vibrio, exception. Uh, I, I didn't say you 100% of all of them. Uh, so, this one, for example, you can keep in mind uh, by the fact most of intestinal infections are caused by gram-negative bacteria. Salmonella, Shigella, Escherichia, Vibrio, Cholera. Okay? So, you put it in a specific group, in a special group of intestinal uh, infections. And you keep in mind it is gram-negative. But most of bacteria that uh, the genus name will finish with A will be gram-negative. This is how you can keep it in mind. So you already can see that Neisseria genus is a, a spherical shaped bacteria, so we also can, it, uh, can call it coccus, uh, that is arranged in pairs, so we call it diplococcus, And this is the uh, taxonomy of uh, the uh, Neisseria. We discussed its morphology, we discussed how it's stained. So please keep in mind, maybe you already know it, but please, rem I, I want to remind you. 
whenever we are talking about uh, tinctorial characters or uh, colors of bacteria, keep in mind, all the bacteria are colorless, are transparent. Yes, if you can see some colonies, they can have a specific color. So together, hundreds or uh, thousands of millions of bacteria arranged in, arranged in uh, colonies, they can give a specific color. But one by one, one by one, if you will observe them under the microscope, without any staining, they are colorless. This is why we apply staining methods. So please uh, remove that thought that all the gram-positive bacteria are purple and or violet, and all of the gram-negative bacteria are red. It depends on technique of staining we apply. So that's clear if we apply uh, purple and red uh, dyes in this technique, some of them normally should be in the end purple and some of them should be red. But if, for example, you take Sil Nielsen staining and you apply it to, uh, to acid fast bacteria, you can keep in mind that Mycobacterium tuberculosis or lepra is gram, uh, gram positive, excuse me, right? Mycobacterium is gram positive. But somehow it is not really possible to apply gram staining for these bacteria. This is why we apply Seal Nielsen staining that makes possible penetration of, of a dye inside the cell. This is why the uh, acid fast bacteria as a result of staining will be red even if it is gram positive. Okay? So we don't misuse it. Um, do you remember why do we need to know difference? Which bacteria is gram positive and which bacteria is gram negative? Is it that important or we just want to know extra features just to, I don't know, be smarter or push off? Important for? Important because, doctor, when we know that this is gram positive and this is gram negative, it means that we have different structures. Mm -hmm. So it's important for applying, for example, if we want to apply a treatment, mm -hmm. uh, antibiotic, for example. So it's very important to know which, which structure we are using. Okay, very good. We should keep in mind, and that's true, that on type of bacteria, and specifically on, uh, uh, it depends on structure of bacteria, which kind of treatment we will apply. Of course, all of you know that we have broad spectrum antibiotics that can kill both gram positive and gram negative bacteria with or without uh, some specific extra structures on the cell. But uh, what you should keep in mind as physicians, as doctors who will prescribe the treatment, we have different cases in which we apply broad spectrum antibiotics and narrow spectrum. There is a difference. For example, when we uh, have an extremely uh, severe infection, here the time is counted on minutes. In this case, everything you can do right now is to take a sample for investigation and without waiting for the result that can last from few hours up to few days, up to one month sometimes, uh, you need to apply some treatment. You can guess according to the symptoms, according to, uh, to epidemiological analysis. Uh, you can guess which is the infection, but unless you have the lab investigation results, it is not 100% uh, confirmed diagnosis. In this case, you apply, you apply so-called empirical treatment or blind treatment. What does it mean? That means before you know for sure we have this or that pathogen, we apply broad spectrum antibiotics that have more chances to affect this pathogen. As long as we start applying this treatment, 
we get the result from the lab and we confirm or infirm our suspicious pathogen. Yes. Okay, uh, what happens? Uh, during, during lab investigation, it is also a good question, Dur during lab investigation, we don't just uh, make check up which is the pathogen, but also we apply uh, sensitivity tests. Uh, the mostly universal uh, way to make this diagnosis uh, is Vitek. And uh, this is a special machine that is able to find out basically all the features in a few hours, up to one day. All the features uh, of, uh, the specific, uh, of the specific pathogen, including its resistance for different, for uh, most, most of antibiotics we, we have. So in the end of investigation, we don't just know which is the pathogen or first of all we find out which is the pathogen, after that we are making another investigation that also lasts and uh, finally you, you get the result uh, that shows the uh, bacteria is resistant. So in order to save this time uh, we can apply such machines. Yes, of course we have classical old style, old style investigation with the stainings but they just save time. For example, you can make drum staining and you reduce number of kits you introduce in this machine because you already know it is gram positive or gram negative. You, you are making it in a few minutes and after that you turn on the machine, you turn on the bike and it, in a few hours up to one day, one working day, uh, about 10 uh, hours, uh, you get the result, including resistance. So you just continue or uh, modify your treatment. Uh, this is when we are talking about emergency treatment, when we don't have any time to wait for the result. But if there is a case, for example, right now, some of you can be in an infectious process, maybe even already with some uh, small symptoms. You already don't feel good enough, right? But since uh, presence is mandatory, you should be here. So on this uh, stage you already can start making checkups if you need or if you want. Uh, or the patient is coming in a hospital uh, not in that severe uh, condition. So we have a little bit of time to find out the result. In this case we do not apply any treatment as long as fever is not too high and uh, as well as uh, symptoms do not develop too fast, we have time to get results. In this case, we do not apply empirical treatment unless, uh, and we do not apply any treatment unless we have results from the lab. After that, we have results. We know which antibiotic is the best one, which is the mostly uh, susceptible, which is, uh, which is the mostly good antibiotic for this infection. And in this, case, in this case, no blind treatment, no empirical treatments, uh, but you apply that specific antibiotic that will be mostly efficient. Because, for example, uh, for example, uh, there, are, uh, there could be few uh, types, uh, there could be few types of uh, antibiotics that are good for Neisseria or a few types of antibiotics that are good for another uh, pathogen, but unless you check the, uh, the resistance, that is very important, and it is a worldwide issue, that is, uh, we are trying to fight with it uh, on the legal uh, level, on the uh, making some reforms in uh, hospitals and the uh, pharmaceutical uh, area to not let anyone using antibiotics just as they wish. So uh, what can happen? Some antibiotics, uh, some, some bacteria could have a little bit of resistance to antibiotics and you don't know it. 
So you will see the positive dynamic, but the treatment uh, will not be complete. Did you get it? So you, you start the treatment, the classical treatment uh, lasts uh, in the most of uh, infectious diseases. Uh, antibiotical treatment lasts about five, seven days, classically. Uh, maybe longer, but it depends on pathogen. Uh, so if you don't have uh, sensitivity test results, you make this classical treatment, you remove all the symptoms, but you cannot be sure that there is no pathogen within. Because we have incubation period, right? Pathogen enters the body, multiplies until that amount that is able to produce some symptoms. It is called incubation period. In that period, we don't have any symptoms. We feel, we feel absolutely okay. After that, we start treatment. Uh, our symptoms will decline until we don't have any symptoms. In the moment we don't have any symptoms, we still have some pathogens in our body. So, if the antibiotic is a little bit less efficient, you didn't stop the infectious treatment, uh, infectious process, you just stopped the infectious disease that includes symptoms. So, in this case, you release the patient, the patient is going home, and in a short period, we have symptoms again. And this time, there is a big chance, it depends on, uh, of course, on uh, type of uh, microorganisms. Some of them are more, uh, uh, more exposed to make uh, resistant, to develop the resistance. Some of them less. But there is a high chance that in a short period, uh, the infection not just the infectious disease not just reappear but also it will be already much more resistant and this time you will finally need to make this test if you avoided to do it in the beginning so you are working double triple or more um, Mm -hmm. And like they are using for three days, they are feeling better. Oh, yes. And they cut yes. yes, it is called abandoned treatment. It is, it is very important. Uh, maybe. If you, if, if you are a doctor and you prescribe ambulatory treatment, uh, to explain this short, uh, this short truth about incubation period and uh, the last uh, part. Because... If you are prescribing ambulatory treatment and the patient will receive, will administrate all the, all the drugs home, uh, a lot of patients nowadays are, uh, uh, are supposed to say, okay, those doctors, they have, uh, they have a deal with pharmaceutical companies. This is why they prescribe me two times more antibiotics, but I'm much smarter than this, uh, this system that makes me dependent on uh, these uh, drugs. This is why as soon as I feel better, I just stop the treatment and uh, they find more benefits in here. First, um, they do not make their bodies dependent on drugs, they, they think. Second, they have a reserve of antibiotic for another case. Because instantly you buy the entire uh, amount of antibiotics you need for the entire treatment. Uh, and after that, they, uh, of course, they finally will need these antibiotics again. They will apply this treatment and they will find out it doesn't work anymore. And they will not go to the doctor to say, you know, doctor, uh, I, did I, I did wrong, yes. They will say, they will blame the doctor. They will say, where did, where did you buy your diploma because your treatment doesn't work. Uh, of course, experienced, experienced doctor will understand that if the treatment wouldn't work, the patient would come after one week, not after a few weeks. So, so the doctor will understand what happened here 
will make the checkup for sensitivity and will say, please, this time you take these antibiotics and you take the treatment till the end. Otherwise, we will meet again on this issue. Okay? Okay. Um, so, talking about Neisseria genus, genus specifically, uh, it is important to know Neisseria species, uh, path pathogenic species, like Neisseria meningitidis or meningococcus, and Neisseria um, gonorrhea or gonococcus, uh, are very, uh, let's say, capricious to the environmental factors. Uh, that is common for most of uh, strictly pathogenic bacteria. Uh, what does it mean? We have three groups of bacteria. Non-pathogenic, or we call them saprophytes. saprophytes. Uh, conditionally pathogenic bacteria. Bacteria that are making part of normal flora, but in specific condition, yes, opportunistic flora also called. But uh, So, uh, these bacteria are basically making part of normal flora, but in specific conditions, by a chance they are able to produce some infections. Or when they get in the place they are not supposed to be, they produce an infection. And the last one is pathogenic. When we are talking about Neisseria species, pathogenic species, they are, uh, they are strictly pathogenic bacteria. Uh, what is... Uh, what is better about conditionally pathogenic bacteria? Not all of them and not all the time they produce an infection. So I can be carrier, uh, and most of you and most of us are carriers so of Streptococcus pyogenes, Staphylococcus uh, aureus, uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis, and so on. We have it on our bodies, in our mouth, in our nose. But not all of us, almost all of us do have this bacteria, but not all of us, we are sick right now even if we do care them around during the entire life. Uh, so, what is good about it, you are not sick all the time. What is bad, they are more resistant to the environmental factors. It is much uh, more complicated to kill them by disinfection, by sterilization, a little bit more complicated. When we are talking about strictly pathogenic bacteria, most of them are uh, very sensitive to the environmental factors to the light, UV uh, lights, uh, to the temperature, to the drying, to the uh, disinfectant substances, nutrition. extremely, yes, and especially nutrition. So uh, they are extremely sensitive to all the factors around, around. It is very good because they cannot survive too much in the environment. What is bad, all of the time you get this bacteria in your body, you get an infection. You get a disease. This is very bad. Now, difference, what is in common? In common shape, in common uh, morphology, in common bacterial uh, cell structures, um, in common they uh, prefer uh, quite same conditions and same places in our body with uh, specific differences. If we are talking about meningococcus or Neisseria meningitidis, the name already uh, gives us a suggestion that it prefers it prefers uh, brain and uh, central nervous system. How it gets in there? This is the mostly dangerous thing about meningococcus that. It spreads mostly through the air. And first of all, it will affect mucous membrane of nasal cavity. This is why first symptoms we have with meningococcus is nasopharyngitis. It will produce an infection in upper respiratory tract. Uh, this is the mostly dangerous part of uh, infectious process because in this period uh, the patient 
is very dangerous as a source of infection. Because in any kind of respiratory tract infection, we have catarrhal symptoms. We have symptoms that affect respiratory tract. In this case, especially sneezing. Sneezing has a very big range of affection. So if I sneeze right now, up to 20 meters are affected. You should keep it in mind. Sneezing is, uh, has, has the big uh, affection area. Coughing about 10 meters, up to 10 meters affection. This is why it is that important when you have some symptoms of this, to wear the mask or better stay home or in a hospital and get treatment. It depends how severe is uh, manifestation of disease. Uh, so, first of all, they get in upper respiratory tract. As a result, for a lab investigation, we can take nasal swab, right? And also, we have, uh, it, it will pass in the uh, central nervous system and will produce meningi meningitis. How can it pass in the central nervous system? Because usually not any respiratory tract infection will uh, turn into meningitis, right? Even if meningitis can be caused not just by meningococcus, not any respiratory tract infection will turn into meningitis. So, Neisseria meningitidis is able to move in the central nervous system through the nose. What do we have there? olfactory nerves and it penetrates fast enough in the nasal cavity from the nasal cavity in central nervous system and it yes and it affects there is no another way how it how it can get there so by this way it will affect meningeal membranes it will produce an inflammatory process bacterial infection that will make inflammation all the classical symptoms of, many, uh, of uh, inflammation. Pain. Rubber, dolor, color, uh, tumor, funcia lexa. So, it is. Uh, okay, redness we can see on the skin, for example. We cannot see there. But inflam inflammation, tumor, uh, pain, um, and uh, lesion of function, and increasing of temperature will be. As a result, which symptoms we have? What is specific? What is specific for uh, what is specific for uh, meningococcal uh, for meningitis? Of course, fever, like in any infection, and please don't misuse with high body temperature. What, what means fever? Fever is more severe. Fever, uh, fe fever excuse me, uh, is over 38 degrees Celsius. That's very clear, everybody knows it, but nobody answers. What is fever? It is temperature over 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, everything that is below, starting from, starting from 37 degrees Celsius, is, so, uh, is subfibrile temperature. And under 37 degrees Celsius is a normal body temperature. Okay? So, we have fever, we have confusion, we have stiff neck, it hurts, you cannot really move too much your, your neck. You have headache, increased sensitivity uh, for light, and vomiting. Why? Because when we have inflammation of meningeal membranes, increases uh, pressure on cerebellum. Uh, where do we have uh, all the all the reflexes? All the reflexes we we have in there. Uh, including vomiting, including uh, sensitivity for uh, f 
for everything that uh, passes, uh, that do not pass through the uh, our conscious. Um, so all the reflexes can be uh, can be affected while while we have inflammation. So in this case, what do we do? <coughs> what? Huh? Yes, lab investigation of what? First of all, it depends on symptoms. Symptoms, because if you if we don't have any meningeal symptoms. Any symptoms of meningitis? Why should we take CSF? Uh, we take uh, we take the specimen based on symptoms. So if we have respiratory tract of, uh, affection, we take a swab. We check for uh, for a pathogen, and we can make a diagnosis. It is extremely dangerous infection especially because it spreads too fast. And it can lead to very bad consequences, especially for children. So the mortality is extremely high, about uh, over 80% mortality if we've got on the level of, uh, if, if we've got up to meningitis if we find it uh, on the level of meningitis. And usually not too much, uh, too much people are making checkups uh, for respiratory tract infections. Not too much. That's the reality, because all of us, we do have a lot of respiratory tract infections every year. But when we already have <coughs> symptoms for meningitis, uh, yes. So not every time it is on time. Uh, if we have symptoms of meningitis, we make cerebrospinal fluid uh, investigation. Uh, the doctor, the experienced doctor, must make the puncture. And in the very beginning, you already have. In the very beginning, you already have the uh, uh, the suggestion: Is there any problem or not? First thing you can see. Does the liquid get out uh, under pressure in a stream or in droplets? If we have a stream, if we have like uh, injection, uh, that means there is a pressure. there is a pressure. It is increased pressure because normal pressure doesn't give you a stream. It doesn't give you a jet. It gives you it, it gives you a droplet. So it is the first sign that will uh, make you know we have or not or don't uh, an infection here. The next one is transparency. Uh, transparency uh, will be present in any other uh, affection but bacterial infection. So if it is a viral meningitis, that is also possible. In this case, the liquid will be transparent. Uh, also, in a fungal meningitis, the liquid will be transparent because uh, because uh, in fungal infections uh, the pathogen is uh, is localized, but in uh, in bacterial infection the pathogen is circulating. This is why uh, just in bacterial meningitis the uh, we will have turbidity of cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, of course, uh, white, uh, white blood cells will be present um, in any case of, uh, um, of meningitis, but most of uh, white blood cells will be present, especially in bacterial meningitis. And proteins. Uh, proteins also will be mostly present in bacterial and in um, uh, in uh, fungal meningitis, in viral, a little bit less. And also glucose will, uh, will be decreased 
uh, in uh, bacterial and uh, normal uh, in uh, viral and uh, fungal. Okay. Uh, treatment. Again, it depends on symptoms. So we can apply. This is what we've been talking about. If we have extremely, uh, severe. extremely severe infection, in this case, first of all, we take samples for investigation and we start empirical treatment. Because we probably, in most of cases, we will guess the pathogen right. But anyways, we apply empirical treatment with, uh, with, a broad yes, with a broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, of course, if uh, symptoms are light, first of all, we apply, uh, we apply uh, the investigation, lab investigation, and after that, specific treatment. Um, prevention. What about prevention of meningococcal infection? More important. Very important. Very important. First of all, it is very important for children. And it is very important in places we have outbreaks. So if, uh, uh, if you can know the uh, local immunization uh, calendar or plan, you will observe that it is not present in, uh, in uh, local uh, calendar for uh, immunization. But if we have outbreaks, we, we have indications for vaccination for a few reasons. First one, just because it is a normal immuno immunization plan. So these infections have high rate basically all over the world, but specifically in this country. So every country will decide uh, will change a little bit uh, calendar for themselves. Uh, it is a normal immunization plan. Uh, second one uh, is uh, by clinical, uh, by clinical uh, indications. If we have some emergency situations in which we need to apply uh, immunization by emergency. In this case, uh, no. 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 Sorry, it's not uh, considered a case of pandemic. There is a small difference. Wait a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, normal immunization plan, immunization by emergency. As example, you, we can take immunization or vaccination against rabies. If you've been by, uh, bitten uh, bitten by yeah, uh, by a dog, dog. It, it is immunization by emergency. In this case, we also apply antibodies, not just vaccine, but also antibodies just to make sure we will not get a disease. But uh, another, uh, if, you, if we take as example uh, coronavirus infection, uh, if it is an epidemic or a pandemic, by epidemiological ind indications. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in case of uh, meningococcal infection, by epidemiological investigation. If we have at least few cases of meningitis, it is a high risk for an outbreak. In this case, it would be important first to isolate the source of infection, uh, second to start the treatment, and third to make uh, immunization uh, by epidemiological indications uh, and check up of all people who've been in contact with the source of infection. Okay, this is about um, meningococcal infection. Talking about <coughs> gonococcal infection. Uh, we, we can make here some uh, comparison. Uh, if meningococcal infection will, uh, will get into the uh, mucous membranes of nasal cavity and will move into the central nervous system, gonococcal infection also will attach to mucous membranes. But, as well as you, do, you should know, it is STI, sexual transmitted infection. So, it, is, it specifically affects 
um, basically genitalia or other organs that are related with other places, other mucous membranes that are related to uh, unsafe sexual contact. Okay? Uh, this is why uh, we have uh, different locations for, uh, for gonococcal infection. Uh, talking about uh, the, uh, the name, gonorrhea, name of disease, uh, what does it mean? If we we'll translate the name of disease, gonorrhea, gono means semen or sperm, uh, in Latin, and, uh, and rea means flowing or discharge. So if, you, if we'll translate the name of disease, it is discharge of semen. Uh, you can, we can make simple comparison. Rino rea is a running nose. Diarrhea is liquid stool. Liquids, yes? Gonorrhea is a discharge of semen. Is it the correct naming or not? Yes? <coughs> okay. That means gonorrhea should affect just men. It is not correct name. It is an old name. So, a long time ago, people thought that gonorrhea is a discharge of semen. Uh, and... Uh, it is because, in most cases, it has symptoms just in men. In 80% of cases, in women, it passes without any symptoms. So she doesn't know she is affected. She doesn't know she is infected. Since this infection and all the sexual transmitted infections will affect people with multiple sexual partners, uh, there is a, a big uh, uh, there is a bigger chance that women will spread this infection more, specifically this one, will spread more than men. Because if you have the symptoms, uh, you are not thinking about anything else, right? You need to solve the issue, and after that, maybe you will have some other wishes. But unless you have some symptoms, you don't know about the issue, and you are just continuing your uh, daily lifestyle. So it is very important to know that people with multiple sexual contacts and sexual partners uh, are in a big danger to get such infections. And as a source of infection, in this very case, women will be much more dangerous because of lack of symptoms. Uh, in men, it manifests in, uh, as uh, morning droplets of pus that are whitish and in old times, have, uh, these, these droplets uh, of pus have been mis misused with, uh, with the semen. Uh, also, the symptom is called uh, droplet bonjour. From, uh, France, uh, from uh, France, it means uh, good morning. Yes? If you can understand it, it's not really good morning. Uh, why especially in the morning? Why, why especially in the morning? Because during the night you don't really go to the bathroom, you do not urinate, and there is a time when the pus can accumulate in urethra. And in the morning, uh, maybe with the first ur urination, uh, first of all, uh, the person has this whitish uh, discharge of pus, and after that, uh, the rest. Of course, it will be with pain, with uh, itching, and uh, so on. Uh, as a result, as a result, uh, for lab investigation, what should we take? 
what should we take for lab investigation? If we have the pass itself, okay, we can take the pass. If not, we are making. Oh, guys, you, you, you better pay attention what are you doing in this life because it is extremely painful making a retro swab. Oh, I, I don't know, I just can imagine. You better don't know also. Okay? So, uh, you take a urethral swab to check it out if you have any pathogens there. Uh, and for women, of course, uh, vaginal or more specific cervical swab because, uh, because uh, gonococcus will concentrate mostly on the cervical part. Uh, now you can ask how can we make investigation for women who do not know about their symptoms. Very simple. That man who has symptoms can hopefully say who was she, right? Uh, and if you cannot, you're bad. Uh, so you can at least contact her and say, are you sure everything is okay? I would recommend you to make a checkup. That's life. Uh, so, everyone is making checkup with uh, such swabs. And we find it out. Is it present or not? Uh, as a culture media that is mostly common for both gonococcus and meningococcus, the mostly spread it are blood agar and chocolate agar. Uh, now why chocolate agar? What is chocolate agar? Blood agar it's clear that uh, it contains protein, humans protein that uh, are mostly delicious for <coughs> Nigeria, right? What about chocolate agar? Maybe they prefer some uh, glucose or caffeine or... No? Any opinions? Any thoughts? What should you know about chocolate agar? Here's the... Here's the difference. You can see, you can see, you can see on, on this slide, uh, chocolate agar and blood agar with uh, an Assyria colonies. So what should you know about chocolate agar? It is called so because of color, not because of contents. So it doesn't contain really chocolate, okay? Uh, but basically, there is no big difference in the contents of blood agar and chocolate agar because uh, in a chocolate agar we have heated blood that just coagulated and changed its color to the, uh, to the chocolate color. This is, this is the explanation. So uh, basically all the uh, culture media that contain, uh, contain humans proteins will be a good culture media for an Assyria genus. Uh, if we are talking about uh, about uh, mostly optimal temperature, I guess uh, I need I, I don't need to, to tell you which is the temperature the best for uh, investigation, right? Which is the temperature? Thirty-seven degrees Celsius. Uh, basically, it is the universal temperature for any pathogenic microorganism we uh, cultivate in the lab. 36, 37 degrees Celsius. Simply because it is our body temperature, that means it is the best temperature for this bacteria, it is the best uh, condition you can provide for this microorganism. Okay. Um, and uh, who could give me the best, or even I would say, the only one, hundred percent efficient way of prophylaxis prevention of gonorrhea or any other sexual transmitted infection. The only hundred percent uh, 
efficient way of prophylaxis, please. The worst proposal you can give. <laughs> Simply because it is uh, quite impossible for most of people. Antibiotics. Antibiotics is a treatment, it is not prophylaxis. Do we have vaccination against gonorrhea? Mm. As well as I know, don't really. Huh? Uh, if we are talking about condoms, uh, please keep in mind uh, the first function is a contraceptive function and the second is protection against infectious uh, agents uh, simply because it doesn't give uh, that hundred uh, percent efficiency we are looking for because sexual contact, contact includes more than just uh, contact between uh, uh, genitalia and here we can, uh, we can send uh, sexual transmitted infection, for example, by kissing, right? So, uh, this is why it is better as uh, contraception that, uh, than as uh, protection against infections. Any other proposals? Huh? That's the closest to the right answer uh, that should be uh, formulated in the following way. The single, lifelong sexual partner from both sides. If we have it, 100% efficiency. 100% efficiency. <coughs> And please keep in mind, whenever somebody is saying, oh yes, but you can also get a sexual transmitted infection by indirect contact, like using same items and so on, yes, technically it's possible, but physically not, not really. So whenever we are talking about, uh, about inf infection by indirect, uh, indirect contact, non-sexual contact, uh, it happened, uh, sometimes it could be funny, but sometimes not really. Because, for example, there, is, uh, there are some parents that are bringing their teenager for a checkup and they find a, a sexual transmitted infection. And parents, oh, I don't know, maybe we've been using same towel or, or something like that. Uh, just as uh, Dr. House told, everybody lies, right? Keep that in mind. First of all, you should investigate mostly uh, possible ways. And just when you excluded all of them, you are looking for indirect contact or habitual contact by using same items. Because you should keep, keep in mind, in most of cases, it is almost impossible. So in such cases, especially when parents are not afraid or scared of what happened, how it could be, how it could happen to my to my kid, in order, uh, instead of being afraid and terrified by what, they're saying, oh, probably I don't know something something. In this case, it should be suspicious for you, because maybe maybe, and there is much more chance that that kid is passing through a sexual violation. Yes. And some of parents do not want you to know about that. Because the normal reaction of any parent is how it's possible. No. And abnormal reaction of a parent is, oh, probably looking for explanations. So it might not even legal. Yes, yes. So first you should, uh, and now imagine that you are thinking, oh no, there is no parent that would admit something like that. Really? Do you think so? Just because you are, you, you wouldn't admit that? You think that others wouldn't? Unfortunately, wrong. 
So uh, don't try to explain like, oh, can you imagine, dear colleagues, we have a unique case and you introduce it in the textbook, like we discovered few cases of uh, almost impossible way of transmission. Instead of making investigation and find, uh, to find out uh, which is the real issue. Because maybe by doing this, you will help someone to ruin someone's life. And you should keep in mind our duty in this world, first of all, to save lives, not to ruin them, okay? So, go from the mostly realistic scenario to less realistic scenario. In this case, in this case, uh, your, uh, your consciousness will be a little bit cleaner, okay? And maybe this world will become a little bit better. Questions? <laughs>